Welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps. Today, I have a true tech powerhouse on the show, Anthony Suhu, a former executive vice president of Walmart with a deep tech expertise and an unwavering belief in the transformative power of AI, particularly in our own community of Northwest Arkansas. Let's just dive into your life in Mittenville and let's get into it and then we'll figure out what your past was and where we're going. Sure. So I think, as you alluded to, my background earlier was in tech. Um, and, you know, some of my friends in tech actually were part of a company called Jet that Walmart had acquired. It was an e commerce company that I believe Walmart acquired back in about 2017. And what was Jet? What was uh, it? was an e commerce company going up after big box retailers. Okay. Um, and think of it initially, it started off with something called Smart Cart, uh, and they had a membership model where it was a cross between. Uh, I would say Amazon and Costco online. Okay. And so the company was acquired by Walmart, I believe in about 2017 or early, late 2016, early 2017. My friend Mark uh, and Scott Hill had asked me to join them after the acquisition and I did. I was running part of the e-commerce group for a few years and then uh, back in 2020 was offered the opportunity to come to Bentonville. Um, you know, having grown up in San Francisco, you know, had lived in New York and uh, Boston, but had never thought about living in the Midwest. We came out here and was just actually blown away by the community that existed out here and what this town was representing. Opened up our eyes. It was a complete shock, honestly. It's it's shocking. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's interesting things for me was the definition of a clip. It's going to be really closed source models like ChatGPT, and you'll see much more open source models. Uh, as well. I think this is definitely going to be a unique addition to the show. Um, the tech world has not been explored yet over here on the Good Time Show. And so thank you for coming. I really appreciate you guys for listening. And once again, thank you for joining the Good Time Show. And thank you, Suhu. And so when we came out and did that, we fell in love with the area. And my wife and I thought, why not take the plunge and see what happens? I did not get offered the executive vice president of Walmart, but I was um, uh, enamored by this place. I want to talk to you about like where you came from because you have a very, it's kind of crazy. I mean, you not only, I don't know if it was the first streaming service in history for that you created um, at CBS, but even before that, um, you learned to code and then you got a job at, or you were messing around with Google before Google was Google and Yahoo was really Yahoo. So dive into me about your past and what got you interested in tech in the early days. Yeah, I would say that uh, if I looked at my career, the foundation, everything I've done has been really based on technology, even if I've done retail or media or just straight tech. Um, I fell in love with computers really in middle school and started learning to program when I was about 11 or 12. My parents bought me an Apple IIe, and one of the things I really loved to do back then was play games, and uh, there weren't enough games that, uh, available to play. And one of the things was we started creating our own games. And so one of the things as a result, which is necessarily drives kind of creativity. Um, and the Apple IIe, is this like back when like Pong? Like what was just like two? Yeah, that was the Atari. But yeah, these yeah. were text-based games. I okay. Mean, the old days of Zork and things like that, where um, if you think about, you know, everything that's kind of happening now with uh, uh, with video games back then, there were no graphics. It was literally just text-based games. Imagine playing video games on ChatGPT. That's kind of what it was like back then. Except if you typed in the wrong text message or the wrong uh, string it would not give you a response and say, I do not know how to answer. So <laughs> I did that for a number of years and uh, realized that I was actually uh, pretty good at programming and ended up trying to make some money by programming for local businesses in, uh, in my neighborhood, accounting firms, uh, law firms, mainly built databases for them. And then ended up, the big break was I uh, got an internship at Apple uh, between my junior and senior year in college and ended up what, can i ask you what year i don't want to like uh yeah man. i i i think it was the early 90s or yeah it was the early 90s so early uh, 90s apple yeah and what happened was i ended up uh digitizing their first global uh supplier database they were trying to digitize and keep a record of um all their suppliers globally where they were buying parts and figuring out what they were paying what they were not and 
that led to me going developing that for them over the summer and then uh, had a chance to really help them out with some negotiations as well and got an amazing view into a product-based company in terms of how businesses were done from inside of a tech company, which was like a dream because coming from my earlier past, I was in love with their, with their product. And what uh, was the, can you just tell me what, cause I'm a big Apple guy. I love mm-hmm, Apple. Mm-hmm. What was the product that was like happening during that time? Was it, do you remember the big? Yeah, it was, uh, it was early days of the Mac, uh, power books. They were about to be launched. Okay. And so if you remember the early, uh, Mac power books, it was a Mac 100. I think it was a 140 and a 180 or the 170. And the 170, the neat thing about it, I believe was it had the bigger screen and a color display, but that was kind of that era. And we, and if you remember the trackpad at the time, you either had a Toshiba where you had the rollerball on the side. Uh-huh. Um, and the big innovation was uh, at Apple, they actually decided to put the trackball in the center because it was more first ergonomically centered for if you're left-handed or right-handed, but also it was just an easier way to compute and use computers. And the company thought a lot, and I learned a boatload there from a lot of smart people on uh, how to design for consumer experiences. And so... I just had this amazing background and felt that it was kind of like uh, they gave me an opportunity to kind of look behind the scenes at a magic shop and I learned some magic with what it felt like. Um, and then, you know, a few years later when I graduated, I went back there and, uh, you know, worked on the notebook products with them as he evolved. And then... Uh, when you say him, you mean... Huh? When you, you said with him? No, no, I said with them. With them? I with thought them. you said with him. I was no, like, no, we? with them. Okay. And then I ended up uh, going to business school, and when I came out, uh, you know, the, f- the Internet was in, full f- was in full swing. The interesting thing, as you were mentioning before, was that when I was at Apple, we used to have these things called the corporate Internet, and everyone had their own little network. Mm-hmm. And there were f- these file systems where you could download applications or, or new applications you wanted to use. And there was an early thing there called the Mosaic. It was the early days of the Mosaic uh, web browser back in okay. early 1994, before Netscape came out. And so I had a chance to kind of see the early days in the Internet and got to play around with a few different uh, businesses that we were trying to start, including a dating site back in 94, 95. And then uh, took off to business school. I came back out and then worked for a search engine company, as you mentioned. So that's a little bit about uh, what happened there right around the Internet time. That's that's pretty cool. Okay, so okay, so you did some Apple. You hang out with some Steve Jobs. Um, well, Steve was gone at that time, but there was. I a was lot wondering because no, I've no, seen the movie. But, yeah, and I was yeah. going to ask. I didn't know whether. No, so, so like, so this is when when Apple became like the business before. Yeah. So before so so the backdrop was uh, Steve had left a really strong foundation and a point of view about how products uh, should be done. And um, I don't know if he was there around the laptop, but I think it was it, originally the idea came from a guy named Alan Kay, who worked very closely with Steve. Uh, they had this concept of a mobile computer called the Dynabook. And that eventually, as it's played its way, there was one, the, the second generation of that became the uh, Apple PowerBooks, which I would say that was a connection to Steve. Uh, Steve, I think, came back to the company about five or six years later. Um, and in fact, when I was in business school, he and I were trading emails about going back to Apple, which is funny enough. And I still have some of those emails. Oh, that's really the, cool. To, uh, with the email exchange with him. so That's pretty great. And then you moved over to CBS. When did you go over to CBS? Because obviously I'm a television guy, and the streaming services have now became an empire. And now I feel like they're all crumbling or whatever's happening. I don't know. Do you have any opinion on the – Yeah, You there's... created the streaming service, then it became the empire. How are you feeling about this new world that we're living in? Well, if you, if you give consumer choices, it's always a good thing, I think. Uh, with Right now, I think it's just going through a period where players are being shaken out in terms of who wants to invest, who does not. Uh, you asked about how I joined CBS. What had happened was I uh, I was at Yahoo. Right? So after right after the search engine company, I started a, an online streaming company, kind of a la, kind of like YouTube. Back in 2000, uh, a few friends of mine were actually working on a streaming idea called Always I, and the idea was to bring independent films onto the internet. And uh, I got involved. I was the COO of that company, and we ended up eventually selling that company to uh, movietickets.com. 
And after the company was sold, I ended up joining Yahoo uh, right after the dot-com crash. And okay. I was initially I joined them because I was trying to buy a company out of there, and then they asked me to join, and I ended up running part of their enterprise software business. I, I actually had a, a, an enterprise software business in the HR recruiting space called Resumix. Um, it was a big turnaround, had an opportunity to turn that business around, and then eventually they asked me to go out to New York to run uh, the hot jobs marketplace, jobs marketplace. I did that for a few years and then had this idea that uh, streaming was now ready and also the idea of social sharing was going to be a big thing. So started a company called Dotspotter that CBS ended up eventually acquiring uh, about a year later. And then uh, Les Moonves put me in charge of the entertainment division for digital at CBS. D and uh, when I was there, I think they were trying to figure out, should they join Hulu, should they not? Uh, what was going to, where was streaming going in the future? Um, and I honestly was surprised that uh, I, you know, usually when you get acquired, you don't get a front row seat to see a lot of this stuff. And here I was front and row seat, but I was actually at the center seat because they were my previous streaming experience from my first startup ended up becoming crucial for them to think through, you know, things that worked and what didn't work, especially on the product side. And then had a great opportunity to work with them and the business team as well as the tech team to figure out how we built a, a streaming service that was going to be credible. And uh, we launched the first full episode streaming service on CBS.com. And because previously they had thought about CBS.com as really a brochure to push shows. And um, I think the lucky break we had was that it was around the right when we launched was uh, in the beginning of tw 2008. So my company was acquired right before the financial crash in okay. September. So just amazing timing. So I get in <laughs> to the company and- um, That worked. Uh, and, and the financial crisis happens. And what happens when people are, um, are at home- They watch more uh, TV. They watch more TV. I know, they, and though, I, I hate to um, hate a recession, but uh, as a television producer, yeah, those it, are the good times. It, it, it goes up and to the right when it happens. So yeah. I- Join, when I joined that business, we were trying to figure it out. We launched in like early 08, I believe. And the okay. streaming service just started taking off. It was beyond that a That was the days stream. when reality TV really took off too. It I was, mean, we it was. was we, and we, we had some of the biggest ones uh, there, if you remember, from Survivor oh, to yeah. Big Brother. I was part of America's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that period, the thing that was amazing for me, honestly, was I had an opportunity to understand how content was being produced. But the more interesting thing, and the thing I learned a boatload about was how content was being packaged. Because the way okay. you package content uh, and how you created windows created value for businesses. So if you put it limited time, you had to watch it for five days, people would flock to it. If you said, if you're opening, it's the same piece of content, but you could sell it within each channel and each within each channel, it felt new again every time you streamed it. So that was a super interesting experience for me to be able to kind of think about packaging the content and how you can take clips and use and get paid for it. But at the same time, it's just promotional material for the network. Because back then, in the early days, you can imagine there was just a dearth of, of professional video content that people are dying for outside of cats on a skateboard. So it just was the early days and CBS had 12 of the top 20 shows at the time, which allowed us to kind of go in and dictate um, in you know, a lot of the demand and we were able to just kind of fulfill, I, I believe the demand was out there. And then when we made it super easy, we were able to drag along and bring in more users. So that's kind of what happened during that period. Wow, that's really cool. Do, what happened to to that software now? Do you what? It, do, do so you know? so uh, yeah, we built some of the early days of the foundational stuff around streaming. Um, I believe that the company ended up using. In fact, we built some of the early subscription services too. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the foundation of some of those code is still being used today for Paramount Plus. For all I know, so funny the code stuff is like it, it is. The code never stops, right? It just gets built on and built on. It's like I, yeah, I sometimes you want to rip it out. But I was going to say sometimes, but, but some of the I was thinking about like what, stuff. like what, um, like Mark Cuban. Yeah, like he sold that company for billions. Did no they, broadcast. Yeah. yeah. Do they use any of that stuff anymore? Is there anything else? No. Um, they probably still use a URL, maybe somewhere. I'm not <laughs> sure, but but I'm sure now. At the time when we were launching, we were launching a new video player. I think every six weeks. 
that was how quickly things were changing. But the neat thing is we went, I think, initially from 480p to 720p within like six months. And then from okay. 720p, we went to 1080p and, and really high dev streaming within the first 18 months, which it was, it was just a, a, a step function improvement in, uh, in terms of compression, compression, as well as everyone just kind of seeing this as a real business. The nice thing about it was that unlike other businesses where you felt like as the incumbent, you would be disrupted back then, CBS's whole business model was advertising based. I think over 95% of their business outside, if you take out Simon and Schuster, their CBS core, their business was uh, really advertising based. And so the streaming service was very complementary to everything that was in their core business. Mm -hmm. But the only thing we had to figure out was which windows they needed to play in. And then also, I think how uh, we ended up having to think about divvying up rights and permissions with the guilds. Um, so that was a really interesting time because we were, I think at the time, uh, defining a lot of stuff that hadn't uh, been thought through. I believe one of the most, I believe at the time, the definition of a clip was two minutes and 13 seconds, something like that. And we were trying to figure out how, and, and my question was, so why is it two minutes and 13 seconds? And do you know what the answer is? No. It's because when they rolled a can of film, one can of film that they were rolling on the lot, it became two minutes and 13 seconds. Oh. And that's kind of became the definition of a, of, of a promotional clip. Isn't it funny how like all these things you think you, they have some kind of massive meanings and yeah, it's just yeah. because yeah somebody did that. Well, know. if you go talk and to nobody, any, and they probably nobody else knows that you just happen to actually research it. Well, someone to, well, we were negotiating about oh, the okay. definition of a clip, and it was two minutes and thirteen seconds. I said, "Why is it not two minutes or three minutes? Why is it two minutes and thirteen seconds?" I, and that was a story I was told. If you go to MIT, I think there's a person named Smoot or Snoot. I think it's Smoot. Um, and there's a measurement called a smoot, and there was a student they had who was a smoot, and I believe he measured himself on one of those bridges uh, lying down through the step, and so they measured, They started using, MIT is a big prank school, I believe they were measuring people based on this guy's, this this guy's height. height. Yeah, That's really funny. MIT is a big prank school. Should we dive into AI? Yeah. So your focus now after Walmart is really... AI focused you really see the future in AI and are you loving AI right now well I think I am very I bullish it. on the future of AI as a consumer it's amazing to me but uh, you know there's there's we have to really approach this with um, a level of caution to understand what's happening and what's not so for instance everyone's fallen in love as you know with chat GPT I think the concern about a closed and network model like that is you really don't know where your answers are coming from um, and you don't know if they're true or not but it sounds very much like truth so I think eventually things would kind of shake out well where what is it, wait, wait, you say that and I think I act like I know what that means but so you're saying close into the open source what does that mean yeah when I say closed source is if you think about the data that's accessed for them to produce the answers um, in a closed source model, you don't know where it's coming from. And they will train the machine uh, to pr produce an answer for you. Um, but all the training's really been done by OpenAI. What you have, and so, so if you want get, to get up and running for your business to leverage their model, you can mm -hmm. get it up and running fairly quickly because it's already been pre-trained with a data set, large language model, data set that you're, uh, you, where it's been tuned for really general purpose search and uh, question and answers. What you have on the uh, open source side is you can add in your own sources, but you're gonna actually have to do the training of the data. So if someone gives you this prompt and you don't like the response, you're gonna have to train the model, which takes a lot more time, but you will definitely get the answer that you're expecting because you're actually doing your own training and you know the sources of where the data is coming from. Okay. Okay. Now, but the big thing is we've had AI for a long time. Just, I want to point this out. Like when we did image recognition on your uh, iPhotos or Apple Photos, I don't know, over the last 15 years, if you typed in car or Disneyland, it would pull up 
photos, it knew you were either taking a picture of Donald Duck or it mm-hmm. knew that it was a car. And then once that happens, people just kind of bleed in and think it's just normal technology. If you think about your phone, we have a lot of that right now where you're telling Siri to do something and it does it. So right. it's always been around. I think the big change, I would say, that's happening with AI today and the moment why I think it's super exciting, at least from the public's perception perspective, is I believe that it's now gone through the first phase is that it's now allowed and enabled for natural language conversations uh, so that you actually as a human can talk to the machines where in the past you had to know the machine language or the computer language, like you need to program in C or Python or, uh, or, so, or, or anything like that. And then now you can tell the computer how you want, uh, what you want to do, and it'll give you back the results. So the computer is actually now speaking a human language, which is a complete flip. Yeah, I find it fascinating because, you know, look, I'm not, I am not asking AI to write me code, yeah. but I am for sure using AI to help me with this podcast. I, yeah. I'm how I'm saying, hey, write me an intro to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Give it some bullet points. It'll crank me out, you know, all the kind of stuff. In Canva, I have it, you know, change some of the backgrounds and right. all that kind of stuff. It is fascinating that you computer guys can now... Um, I mean, you can just tell it to build you a code to the website, a website that with, if, as long as you feed in the right terms, it will crank you out a, a an original website that you can just post. Yeah, I think there's two things that's happening right now. The big change of generative AI is that first it's understanding, and as I mentioned before, it's speaking the same language as humans now versus before you had to speak in the machine's language. Mm-hmm. The second part is it's offering a level of reasoning, which... I believe if you ask most people, a lot smarter than me, are saying they still don't understand uh, how it's really working, but the machines are actually thinking and learning. And and, and it's getting better because they are actually, the machine learning is actually really learning. And so the idea of reasoning and the idea of being able to speak in natural language to a machine that humans understand or the human language, those are really the thing that's kind of unlocking this this big Cambrian explosion of innovation or what people are talking about. And if you think about the internet, before the browser came out, the internet had existed when I was in college, I think, uh, in the early 90s before Mosaic, you actually had access to the internet. It was just all text-based. You would send out an email and it felt so creepy that someone would send you back something that, and you're like, it would wig you up that actually you could make that human contact at first. But it was all text-based. There was no browser. Um, and even in the early days when we I was playing around with the Mosaic browser, I think there were like maybe 70 websites that we had access to on the web. So the reason this is so exciting right now is because it's gotten a point where AI is being democratized in a very big way. I got ChatGBT, I opened it up, and I was giving it demands, right? I was just going, hey... I want this, execute this. I watched my nephew, who is much younger, you know, he's probably 15 or Mm -hmm. something. Instead of it just giving it a task, like do this for me, like he's just Mm -hmm. a employee at work, he started chatting with it like it was a human. Mm -hmm. Like he just started Mm -hmm. saying, hey, how's it going? And I'm doing pretty well. And he's like, man, I'm really trying to figure out some things that I'm confused about. Oh, and it just started talking to him and it was building a relationship Instead of just going, oh, it trying to just guess what my task was, he just slowly started educating the machine wh- how he was feeling, what he was, what he was going on in his mind. But I, and it was a much different, more per, which kind of was freaking me out. But I was like, wow, when people don't have friends, this is going to be their friend. But it was really interesting to watch the computer do things for him as they work together instead of it just producing something that I'm telling it to do. Yeah, so I would say the big difference between how you thought about it versus how your you said your nephew, nephew was using yeah. is that he was, it would say he? Yeah. He was producing much more of a, a relationship with a computer and it would be personalized over time because the computer actually, uh, I would say the AI ended up knowing him a lot more. I think you looked at uh, when you were going through 
and trying to get responses much more transactional because it was like give me this and then you get something back but you don't, they didn't really get to know you that well except they have to look through your history um the interesting thing early days some of the at least popular thinking today is that uh the conversational uh kind of method of using this ai like what your nephew is is going to be great for some things that uh previously didn't happen as an example executive coaching or just coaching in general and the reason being that you're going to get someone there that p humans actually feel like they're not being judged and um and they're going to get an honest objective uh, uh answer back if they wanted one or someone there just to listen but you're not being judged i think that when you sometimes when you're talking to someone who on a couch or else when the other person happens to be human and even if you're paying them 120 200 bucks mm -hmm. an hour to listen to you you feel somewhat judged and one of the big opportunities i think is in the areas of coaching the other one obviously uh will be advice giving um doctors uh like telemedicine is probably going to go up in a big big way because uh how many times would you say you're going to trust sometimes a diagnosis from one doctor if they don't, you don't like the response you will probably want multiple risk uh answers before you f make a decision well what you can do is tell ai give me 30 answers from the top 30 uh places of uh where this knowledge came from and so you'll get back a, a response in record time so it's just going to make the idea of information retrieval much more effective and efficient i, I you know not that about doctors but it is interesting about doctors yeah i, I um i had a back surgery it didn't go really well and you know it's amazing how a doctor matters. Like it, the specific doctor matters. You can go through twenty qualified kind of doctors, but only one might. Those twelve might have killed you, and then one might have just saved your life. But yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's so to be able to get all the information very quickly. And you know, I'm using what I found Jet GBT really crazy for was you know. Um, but now I'm thinking about doctors. That kind of opens the door to even a crazier world because I just thought it was super cool. They'll be like, hey, from downtown Bentonville you know, give me the top five trails that are in this location instead of having to search the internet far and wide. You know, it gave me a little, it gave yeah. me a little, little travel guide, but to think that it can do that for doctors of like, Hey, I'm having this problem with this. You know, I don't have to call my physician who may or, you know, you want to think that your doctor knows everything, but he, they're just mechanics. They may know more about yeah. the carburetor the more than they do with the water. Or, I, I think you'll probably in the, at least in the foreseeable future, um, I believe a doctor is going to give you the final um, diagnosis. But what this can enable a doctor to do is two things. One is it can um, it can work with a doctor to make sure that they have the whole comprehensive view and maybe go back and forth with the doctor and challenge them in terms of what the diagnosis is, if it's serious. And the second thing is when the doctor's in the room, they can probably rate the doctor's response and if you want to create something where you want to improve the doctor's bedside manners, mm -hmm. um, I think AI will be able to kind of do that with the doctor uh, in a very objective way, which is going to be interesting. I don't see, I really like the word that Microsoft uses for AI, which is for humans, thinking about AI as a co-pilot versus the primary pilot. It really there is there to be a thought partner but in no way can it do a lot of these tasks by itself. It still needs humans and it will need more. Um, what's gonna be interesting when people make this argument is, this is, I believe, gonna create different and new jobs just like the internet did before, like who, you know, 50% of the titles I believe in exist today and professions didn't exist, you know, about 30 years ago. I think so you gonna, think it's going to create more opportunities? I think it's going to create uh, different opportunities, and I think in some areas it's going to expand. Um, if you look at the auto industry at one time, sure, there was a lot of automation, but then it opened up a whole wealth of other jobs as well um, in that industry over time. Robotic technicians uh, come to mind. I think there's going to be you know, CAD designers. didn't exist before. I think shop, when you think about optimization, AI can make something more efficient. And this is the thing 
people get wrong. But if you're already an in inefficient organization, the only thing AI is going to do is accentuate the fact that you're inefficient. So it's not like you can think, I'm going to put technology in a room and all of a sudden my whole business gets better. I don't think it does. If you didn't know how to run your business before and you put AI there, AI is going to actually make you run the business worse because okay. it's only there mimicking a human being. So if you can't lead that <laughs> business, you're you're ultimately going to be pretty screwed. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty good. I, I got to tell you, I... I've been loving it. For me, AI is really changing a lot of things as um, me being an independent producer right now to be able to create a workflow like that I have, you know, a huge team of people like I did, you know, on a show where there's, you know, 30 of us all working on a show and collaborating. And yeah. it's interesting for me how, how AI is helping me creatively. And that's, it's meant to do that. And I, I think that for creative folks, it will unlock writer's block so you can get a first draft and go, oh, I, that was not really what that's I wanted exactly, to do, yeah. right? And in addition, it will allow you not to do the tedious work that sometimes you had to do, like editing, let's just say. And it can do most of the jobs, the tedious work that you did not want to do and unleash you so you can focus on the stuff you wanted to do and you can probably do a lot better. And so I, I, I think it's going to open up those type of opportunities. And going back to what I said one of the biggest issues that creative folks had is, especially in the, I don't know, the pre-2018 days, is that when you had a great creative idea, you would have to go beg a developer to help you make it real if, you, if it was anything related to tech. Mm -hmm. Well, now you can just tell um, the machine in a language you don't have to learn how to program and say, this is what I'm trying to do. And it's amazing the initial results that you can get. So I do think that we are now playing at a play, uh, we have leveled the playing field. So it's going to unlock technology for the masses in a big way. And what I mean by unlocking is not from a user perspective, because because everyone's been using technology for the last 20, 25 years. But I do think what it will allow everyone to do is be a creator of tech, which is something that has not happened before. And even in the specialized case that you were talking about uh, in terms of Adobe or Canva, you know, I'm sure you've played around or checked out Adobe's generative fill. Um, you can now just say, I want this background. I want to change it where I want this whole scene to change. And you just kind of point at it and it does a whole thing for you. Yeah. How many crazy. times in the past did you have to kind of beg the design department to do oh. that for you? And then now when you get and it costs a, it costs a ton of money. Yeah. I mean, I legitimately, like the one that, you know, I was doing, I was redoing the album covers for All Mike Show. And um, Josh Kyle sent me a picture and had people in it. I didn't want to show the people. I mean, I didn't know yeah. them. They haven't, they haven't given me permission to show right. their face. It'd be kind of rude. They'd be like, why, why? Am, I didn't want to be on the Good Time Show. Right. But they should have. They should have wanted to be on the Good Time Show. But I just I highlighted them all and then turned them into mountain bike. So yeah. and it and it goes more along with the the album cover than what right. it was. Right, right. So if you guys thought that was real mountain bikes, but they were AI driven, and yeah. um, now that I'm with Suhu, I feel okay about it. So, but you know, if you if you told something uh, the machine to create you a masterpiece, it cannot think that. It, 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 I think some of the stuff it it requires a creativity of how you want the scenes to look. Um, and you have to be very specific about what you're looking for. Now, it can do some of the basic functions of democratizing access to that, but it's, if, you, if, you, if you really want to create original work, um, eventually as, you're, as things get more scaled, humans will still play a big role in terms of deciding where pieces fit, everyone becomes a director, and everyone's going to be a creator from a director standpoint versus just having to go through the process of, of begging to get something out there because you, I think it collapses the production timeline in a big way until you're ready for the, to produce the final cut. And then I think it unlocks it. Yeah, I was, I was messing around with one of the AI platforms when it came to um, doing artwork. Mm -hmm. And it was, it's not so great. It was, you know, it produced some stuff, but it was, it was just all kind of weird. Well, if you play with Dolly, I don't That's think, the one. That's yeah, the one yeah. So if you go with Dolly or one of those, it sucks. Uh, I, I don't think it's completely there yet. I do think that if you upload an image in other services with your photo on it and said, hey, please change this to the Obama uh, political campaign photo or something like that, it does that type of stuff well. But, uh, you know, probably 
you can probably ask whatever you're asking. Just assume it's going to be like a Times Square artist, something you can get a Times Square artist to do. The machine can probably pull something like that off, but it won't give you work like the quality that you're accustomed to on the creative side. What are you doing now? That's a great question. I think my wife asked me that every day. <laughs> um, so I, I, after I left Walmart, I really just wanted a break. And I, I do think that I've been fortunate enough to have unlocked and had this moment where I've had a chance to take a step back and be really creative. And so I've really thrown myself over the last nine months. And I've been fascinated with AI for quite a bit of time. In fact, I worked in AI in my last uh, startup prior to Walmart and actually ended up having three patents in AI. But I, I really dove myself into the world of artificial intelligence. I've actually done a lot of writing about um, uh, how to run companies in a new in terms of driven by and leveraging tech as a co-pilot. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing some teaching, as I mentioned before. So uh, everything I've been doing has been with a purpose, with two purposes. One is understanding what technology and AI is good for or not good for. And the other one is how can I run businesses better even without technology? And that's been really a, a focus of mine. So I joined a uh, board of uh, a TC-backed enterprise SaaS company uh, based in Berlin. I've done teaching, as I mentioned before, and got involved with Harvard Business School. And I've joined the AI Fund in terms of helping the AI Fund launch new companies. And the AI Fund is uh, backed. They're, the AI Fund is an uh, a, a investment firm started by Andrew Ng, the founder, who was a chief he was the chief AI officer at Google and Baidu, and also he was founder of Coursera, teaches computer science and AI at, at Stanford. And uh, he raised $200 million from Sequoia, uh, NEA, Greylock, and SoftBank with the, idea of, with, with the idea of, of incubating new AI companies. Okay. And so it's been super fun to work with them and work with entrepreneurs to launch companies because I certainly don't intend to launch new ones. What I plan to do next, eventually, probably when I develop a more f firm thesis, is how can I leverage this AI uh, as well as technology, as well as thinking about how companies should run in this new day and age, how organizations need to work, um, to apply it to a business that's much more at scale and, and jump in as a CEO and probably go run something like that. And uh, my interest level is I've and I outlined it, will probably pull me into doing something with uh, with private equity, but we'll see. So you're going to be part of trying to acquire different companies? I mean, uh, remains to be seen what, what exactly what the formula is. There might be just even a new formula about how private equity should exist and where value gets created. But I do know that uh, there's been a recent McKinsey study that came out about the uh, the concept of CEO alpha, which is a, the outsized results that can be driven if you had a CEO who can be full stack, who can think about you know, strategy all the way down to execution, cross-functionally across a lot of different groups. And the returns and the results are amazing from it. So could um, I go into a situation like that uh, with my background of understanding retail commerce and tech, as well as um, my deep under my understanding of how functions work today and how they should work and be able to deliver CEO alpha. I think that that's kind of uh, something I'm working through right now, but should be exciting. What do you see? Do you have a, do you have an idea of what you think the future is going to look like? Like, do you have, have you thought about like the future of Suhu and the future of like, where do you think all this might go? Well, my future is usually a joint decision, as you know, that I yep. make with Marilyn, my that's, wife. That's how a good, uh, it's how a good relationship uh, should work. Yes, and I would never do anything without my wife. But what, what I would say is that um, the only thing I know about predictions is that I'm going to be wrong. That being said, uh, what I have been doing is I do have a view or a point of view of where the world will end up in 10 years. And I do think in 10 years... Um, you know, there's going to be the, we're going to live in a world where some of the, our biggest problems will be. I think we're going to make progress in some of the biggest areas as a result of technology. 
uh, some of the biggest problems that exist around climate may be around innovation with, uh, with healthcare or pharmaceuticals. I think those things will probably uh, be made better through technology if you take a 10, 20 year lens. Same thing with supply chain, by the way. Um, so some of the biggest problems where there are so many different parameters that the human brain and just can't necessarily solve, you have a complete collaborative partner there. And I wanna figure out in that world uh, what my place is and how I can get involved and add value. And I think that that's how I look at it. And uh, at this time, since I'm in my school, my I, I'm in school right now in many respects in that phase, I would say that uh, I don't really know what I want to be when I grow up yet, but it'll be fun to figure out. Yeah, I, do, I, I feel like I kind of am in the same boat on a different level of like, you know, I've been, I've been doing this TV world for a long time, and then I came to Bentonville. Um. But so there's so many different people that you come in contact with, I think, that uh, you provide ideas for. And I, I feel the same way for myself because I advise a bunch of uh, companies and I angel invest that I, I think that they're, when we finally figure out exactly what we're going to do, it's going to feel obvious. I put Planet Good Times out to the world and um, it started to take shape. There's a promising world of like trying to produce media that's going to produce a good time. Well, I, I think the neat thing about what you're doing here with uh, Planet Good Times yep. is that the world needs more happiness. And as you think about all of us coming back out of uh, the pandemic, I think we're all creating our new norms. And while this show I know and your focus has been on in Northwest Arkansas, I think you have a global reach because everyone, you speak a global language where everyone wants to be a little bit happier than they are today. And if you think about that as a platform and what you ultimately will drive is that knowing you, you're a connector. And I think if you can connect happiness with human beings and be able to connect people to each other and drive more happiness, that's a pretty interesting mission, I would say. And it's, uh, that's something that the machine might be able to help up to a point, but you really need someone in the center who's like the nucleus who brings everyone together. So I think that uh, you, know, you bring a very unique perspective to the whole thing and a lot of value that I don't think a machine can replace. I haven't found the machine to be funny yet. I no, mean, it can it can write kind of funny jokes or whatever. Yeah, and the machine can respond to your questions, but they can't prompt you on answer uh, in terms of changing it can't conversation. Really, do sarcasm? It can't. And it, and even when you make a mistake, it's still funny, right? And right. so the machines don't make when they make mistakes. It's like a hallucination. They try to hide it. Do you have an idea of like how AI might even benefit like this community or? I think it's really exciting right now because, as you mentioned before. Technology would happen in clusters in, in small areas, such as you had San Francisco, uh, you had New York, and then you had a little bit more smaller movements in tech, maybe in, um, in Seattle or Boston or LA. Um, as things evolve, especially with technology today, where things are being democratized, the thing about AI, as we mentioned earlier, is it's, uh, you don't really need to know how to program to be able to talk to the machine to get it to do what you want it to do. The second thing is that machines are doing reasoning and in these days with the cloud, I believe that this is gonna unlock opportunities for a lot of companies outside of the major tech hubs that we've mentioned. Um, so if you have a lot of ingenious entrepreneurial people who before never had access to world-class technology, I think that this opens it up uh, in a big way for uh, people here in Northwest Arkansas who uh, are starting companies or running businesses. And I think that if you look in the future, there's gonna be many of them that are gonna be tech companies, even if they don't know it, because a lot of their values are gonna come from the tech that they're driving uh, but they are going to get there because technology now has been democratized and has been really distributed throughout the rest of the country. So when you think about communities, activating a community really still will revolve around people activating other people. I think for some of the bigger problems that we have in our cities um, and communities, I think that AI can help solve some of the problems, may it be around um, money management, 
education, climate, um, uh, figuring out what to do with waste, uh, especially, you know, spoilage it comes to food, comes to mind. So I'm, I don't think AI is going to be the thing I, I th that solves everything. But if you had a very focused case, I think it could do some of those things a little better. So you're not going to be worried about the world. Uh, I mean, I am an optimist at heart. Me too. I do think we have to go into this uh, being very responsible with the mindset of being responsible so that it doesn't, AI doesn't turn bad. But uh, the other thing I think is that we need to work together with this and influence it in the right way. Sometimes in media, I would say, having come from the media world, we have a tendency to take headline grabbing things that makes no sense. You and I grew up when the news existed for about 15, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, then it went to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And now people are what? Accessing news every 20, 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I do think that that's uh, changing the mindset for people where people are looking at something when we don't have an exact answer and it's not solved yet, that we think it's gonna be bad. I do think I do a lot that, of yeah. these things, it's an open debate and open for discussion. I think it's going to be a collaboration between government, um, the private sector, uh, and tech's only one of the players. You're going to have retail. You're going to have transportation. You're going to have um, uh, the food industry. You're going to have services like the medical industry, healthcare. You just go down the line. I think it's going to be a collaboration among every different group working together to see what's right for society. And what we want to do is um, we certainly, if you think about it, there's there's areas where we can be more efficient or we can be more effective or problems are so big with so many parameters we can't solve. And I'm glad that we're getting to a point where we're going to have potential help with machines, but it does not mean that uh, we don't have to look to the other side. We have to actually take a measured approach and make sure that we don't leave people behind. And as far as I'm concerned, we're living in plenty of good times. Well, I, and to support your point, I know right now the financial market does not look great. Yep. But we've had the biggest bull market, one of the biggest bull markets in the history of the world. And I think if you look at prosperity and uh, how long we are living average versus, let's just say, 50 years ago, I think what life uh, longevity and expectancies doubled during that time. For sure. A huge advances in medicine. Our life, what we work on today versus let's just say a hundred years ago, what people used to work on. Like they would laugh if they were watching some of the stuff that you do or I do that's called work in front of a computer, right? Right. And so life has gotten better. Oh, yeah. Uh, if you take a look at it holistically. So we should keep that in mind. So you think that tech is actually going to create a lot of opportunities? I think there's gonna it's gonna open up a lot of opportunities, yes. And the reason being that is this. Um, in the early days or even prior to the last three or four years, you know, when you wanted access to developers, you really needed to a great developer you needed to be in one of those hubs. Now technology's gotten to a point where it's you're going to leverage technology the same way you and I are in the future. We use personal computer and we use programs. And if you can use it from a productivity standpoint, there's three factors that drive value with artificial intelligence. One is that uh, you're going to have compute power. The second part is going to be algorithms and third is data. The first two are going to be at these tech centers, but the real value will be the data. And all the data is being uh, produced, I think, by interesting businesses, and a lot of them are going to be in around the middle of the country, including Northwest Arkansas. So I, I think that it's going to have its own knowledge of and, and unique exclusive data that will only lend itself to creating interesting businesses. And in the old days, when you wanted to start something, uh, and you couldn't, the first question is, how do I get some of these engineers to do it for me. But when now you could probably tell the machine to do it and that machine might be here, or be out in the cloud, or it could be a bunch of developers in, in, um, in Brazil for, for any of you since it's close, nearly in the same time zone. So I think it's gonna unlock actually new entrepreneurs in the area where in the, ba in the past their only bottleneck was access to great technology. And every 
company that gets started in one way or another will be infused with tech. It's just that it will be much more democratized uh, for folks that want to start businesses now. I think every company is going to be a tech company. I know. Yeah. I mean, I'm a tech company. Yeah, and every and I know nothing. And every company is a content company. And every company is a commerce company. So you're gonna what we're gonna see is it's all gonna just blend together. And I do think you're right. Like every company, because that's kind of been my my kind of view on it is that every company now, no matter what it is, they're just trying to tell their story. Like everybody just wants to tell their own stories. Whether it's you know whether it's the furniture company, they want their story to be told in a certain way that makes sense to them as a person. And I think that um, yeah, it's an interesting time now where it's like you don't necessarily need the face of an influencer to market your company more than you need the voice of the company to be that entity. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely. And I believe that the definition of where thing, of how value gets created will change a lot. Just like in the old days, probably at one time, you know, there are businesses that were powered by electricity and some that were not. And then after a while, you just stop thinking about it. Well, tech's going to be abstracted and infused that way in everything we do. It's just going to be like electricity. Oh, that's um, true. Yeah. And so if you look at it from that standpoint, so how do you add value? And, you know, you don't think about all the things that go into delivering power to your house anymore. And that's going to be, I think, the same way with a lot of tech. This has been a good time, Sudo. Appreciate everything you're doing at Planet Good Times and can't wait to, to see how you evolve this uh, platform of yours because I think that the world needs more happiness. So, Well, that's our show. If you didn't get a chance to watch the episode, check it out on YouTube and Spotify. You can also listen to The Good Times Show on Apple Podcasts or any other platform. We are always trying to grow our Planet Good Times community, so subscribe and follow us at Good Times Us on almost all social media platforms. This episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas, a social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody.